It's a very, very good week, though. Wonderful time celebrating the Lord and celebrating family. We're glad you're here. I know that there's people in crisis all over the world, in our country, and of course with some of our states trying to discourage people from getting together and fellowshipping, worshiping together, praying together. And of course, we understand that people are getting infected by COVID. The good news is that most of the people that get it get a headache and a fever for a couple of days and they recover and that's the end of it. Uh, other people like myself, of course, you guys know that I had a pretty good bout, still trying to recover and learn to breathe again. But um, I'm thankful that we still have the opportunity to gather like this and worship together, and I think we should. <clears throat> we absolutely should. Those that are weak need to watch online. Those that are sick need to stay home, please. Amen? Watch online as well, but uh, we're praying for those that are sick. There's two or three people right now that are part of our fellowship that have COVID. It's mild, and we thank the Lord for that, and uh, they're recovering quickly. But it is out there. Uh, I guess it's going to continue for a little while, at least until um, the Lord sees fit to give us reprieve from this and we move on to the next crisis. For in this world we shall have tribulation. Amen? But we're certainly not going to stop the world. We're not going to stop the church. That's for sure. The church is essential and we're thankful to be busy about the business of the Lord. Listen, you guys, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 30, recognizing right away that we are in the book of Romans. We spent a few weeks in Romans chapter 9. I left off last Sunday giving you the indication that I would probably want to redevelop with you the 10 keys or 10 commandments of understanding Romans 9, 10, and 11, in particular Romans 9. And um, I think I'm going to hold that off till Wednesday night. So if you come on Wednesdays or if you watch online Wednesdays, we'll go back over those quickly and then we'll do a Q&A related to those things and, and just allow the Lord to lead us and direct us as we have that discussion. But I want to at least remind you that last week when we left off, we were talking about the fact that in the context of Romans, we're dealing with soteriology, the study of our salvation. Soteriology is the study of our salvation. But Paul, who's very concerned about the Gentiles becoming arrogant about the faith, may think that God has replaced Israel with them. That the church is the new Israel and that God has no future plan for Israel. And so in the middle of a book where we're dealing with soteriology, we are now giving some focus to Israelology. I left off with this last week. And so I'm teaching you these terms because it will be simple when we move forward, if I mention soteriology, I don't have to explain a lot more about that. Or Israelology, the study of Israel, uh, that's kind of self-explanatory. I think most people know when I say Israelology uh, what we're talking about. Of interest to me is that most of our systematic theology courses in Bible schools and seminaries today do not include Israelology. In fact, if you have a systematic theology book in your library, go to the table of contents and find the subheading for Israelology, and I suspect that you will not find it. Which is interesting to me, since the Bible is a Jewish book about a Jewish Messiah and focused entirely on Israel and, and the Jews. The Gentiles get introduced into this here and there, but primarily, we're dealing with the Jews. We're dealing with a Jewish Messiah and with Israel. And so in our study, chapter 9 really gives a lot of attention to Israel's past 
and God's sovereign elective purpose with members of the household of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for his own purposes. And that God has sovereignly chosen to use certain individuals in history for his own purposes. And that God is perfectly just to do so. He can choose to use anyone he wants. And he does. And he did. Now in chapter 10, we're dealing with the subject of Israel's present condition. Still with the focus of God's purpose in Israel and for Israel and a future plan for Israel and Paul communicating his heart related to Israel and his prayers for them that they might be saved. But included in chapter 10 is almost exclusively Old Testament passages of Scripture. You might remember from last week's study that I mentioned to you, and I'm going to use another one of those unfortunate in theological terms, eisegesis. We identified for you that there were many passages of Scripture that were taken from the Old Testament and they were pulled out of context and used for Paul's purposes in communicating to the Romans, which is a mix of Jew and Gentile. Eisegesis is when you take a, a passage of Scripture out of its context and you force an opinion into it or utilize it to reinforce something that you would like to say. Uh, typically, we don't like to do that. There are times that it is important, especially illustratively. God did this here, therefore God can do this there. It's not necessarily saying what God did, there is what he is doing here. Uh, but it is illustrative, and so that's what was happening in chapter 9, eisegetically, taken out of context and used for a purpose. In this case, chapter 10 is almost exclusively Old Testament passages, oftentimes used eisegetically and elaborated upon, and a meaning given to these passages that wasn't part of the original context of the author and the audience then when written and then communicated. And so it requires some work. We can do that, can't we? Indeed, indeed. And so I want to simplify it. I will give you a, a bit of a primer on it as we go through, but um, I want to give you the focus as we begin, probably try to wrap up in the same way, and not dig down too deeply into the text by saying this. God wants us to know as Gentiles, as Paul is indicating, that his purpose with Israel is not over, that he is going to restore Israel and the land of Israel, which is an indication to us that we're talking about the literal Israel and the literal land because of the, the boundaries, the geography, uh, rivers mentioned, etc., all part of the literal interpretation of Scripture are utilized in the texts. Why is this important to us? We've covered this. If you've been around candlelight any length of time, you've heard me talk about these things before. If you're visiting, these are much more important to you because... Most Christians today believe that God has replaced Israel with the church and that God has no future plan for the national people of Israel or the land of Israel, which is entirely untrue. And God has made promises to Israel, and if he doesn't keep those promises, then we have no reason to believe that he will keep his promise to us. And that's fundamentally what I need you to take home today. If God does not keep his promise to Israel, keep his covenant with Israel, we have no reason to think that he will keep his covenant with us. But God does keep his promises. But in the processes of keeping his promises, there are certain things that God will do in spite of man. And there are other things that he will only do in cooperation with man. So we call these things covenants. Some are conditional and some are unconditional. There is an unconditional covenant that God has with Israel and with the land of Israel. There were conditions placed on the way 
the Jews would abide in the land and the blessings that they would have while in the land, and that was conditioned upon their obedience. If they disobeyed, they would be cursed. If they obeyed, they would be blessed. But there is the unconditional nature of the covenant that God has with Israel. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with God maintaining his promise for his own namesake and that he will indeed finish everything he began both with Israel and now because we are believers in Christ with us. You've heard the expression from Philippians, he who has begun a good work and you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, I want you to be able to have confidence that God will be faithful to complete the work he has begun in the believer just as much as he will be faithful and is faithful to keep his word to Israel. Amen? So, Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to read through this rather quickly only to point out to you that most of the meat of today's discussion is found in Deuteronomy 30, eisegetically used by Paul in Romans 10, and given new elaborative meaning. But the point that we're making here is that God has a covenant with Israel and with the land and the conditions related to their use of the land and the conditions that, by which God will bring about his greater fulfillment as we work our way through chapter 10 and then into chapter 11 when we see Israel fully restored. So, it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you. Now, when in this case is future tense. And it relates to the things that God had told the children of Israel. In this case, meeting in Moab looking across the Jordan Valley, preparing to go into the land under the leadership of Joshua. Mo uh, Moses is at the end of his days, and the children of Israel have been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years because of their rebellion and their unbelief, and those that were above the age of 20 have all died off, and now this younger generation of Jews, uh, they are prepared to go across the Jordan and into the promised land. And so we're revisiting earlier communications. And in this case, in the book of Deuteronomy, in particular, chapter 28, we have a list of things that God said, if you do these things, you'll be blessed. And if you don't do, do these things, you'll be cursed. And then he goes here in verse, thir uh, verse 1 of chapter 30, it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. So when this happens, now this is before they go into the land. And now he's telling them, you're, effectively he's saying, you're going to go into the land, but you won't obey. And so when all these things happen to you, when you experience the blessings for your obedience, and when you experience the curses, and I'm going to scatter you, and when I bring you back into the land, you'll then experience blessing that you'll remember these things. You will return to the Lord your God, verse 2, and obey his voice according to all that I command you today. And your children with all your heart and with all your soul. You should underline those words in your Bible. The word all. Very important. We're not talking about a half-hearted worship. We're not talking about a, a temporary worship. We're talking about an, a complete recovery from sin. Now that relates to the kingdom age and it relates to the new covenant. That the Jews have yet to experience. Now, certain Jews have. There's a remnant according to the election of grace. We talked about that last week. We'll be talking about it in days to come. God has a remnant of those he has elected intentionally for his own purposes according to grace. And in this case, this group of individuals looking forward into their journey into the promised land now have been given a prophecy concerning their entry 
the scattering and the return. Now that takes us into some history because we know that the Assyrians scattered Israel, uh, the northern ten tribes. We know that the Babylonians took the two southern tribes into captivity. We also know that there was an exodus, not from just from Egypt earlier, but now from Babylon, where the people would return from Babylon to their own land and they would rebuild the temple and there was worship and so forth. But then as history would develop until we get to the Gospels, where Jesus is here walking on the face of this earth and ministering to the house of Israel, that they're under the tyranny of Rome and that Rome would ultimately destroy the temple and scatter the people all over the face of the earth. That happened in 70 AD. And now we have seen, some of you in your own lifetime, uh, I was born in 1960, so I didn't get to see this with my own eyes, but I've certainly lived through what is the regathering of Israel into the land since 1948. I should suggest that Israel has been in the land, people from Israel, Jews, have been in the land the whole time. But it wasn't recognized as Israel until 1948. And as a state re-recognized, it is effectively the only state in the world, in the history of the world, to be born again. It is a, a nation of people that were, that were not, and then have come together again. Now, this is interesting. So now where are we? We are watching God begin to bring back the people into the land. We're beginning to see prosperity in Israel. We're beginning to see uh, fruitfulness and multiplication in Israel. And all this is part of the prophecies of the end times. We're living these things in our very lifetime. Every day when you turn on the news today, you're watching Bible prophecy. It's an inescapable. I'm thankful that President Trump was very involved with Israel and helped the Israelis secure Jerusalem as their capital. All of these things are very important as we see the redevelopment. I have no idea what to think about uh, in, in the coming days. We're still anticipating and waiting and seeing what will develop, but uh, I don't want to give you a downer on the Sunday after Thanksgiving, but to me it's not looking all that good. We'll see what God does. Amen? Either way, God's on the throne and God's still going to do what he's going to do in spite of man. And so he's going to keep his covenant. Now he goes on to tell them, the Lord your God, verse 3, will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven from all, there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. So they did possess it, they were dispossessed, and they will possess it again. This is very important because those that believe that during the days of David, when the, the, the land that had been promised to Israel had been possessed by the people of Israel, that that prophecy was fulfilled, failed to mention that they will be dispersed following that event and they will be regathered again. So what was possessed will be possessed again. And we're still waiting for that. It has not yet come to its fullest fruition and therefore we know it is in our future. It cannot uh, escape our attention that this will come to pass. And so you will go back into the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And so this circumcision of the heart is part of the new covenant. This is something that is yet to come. Now in Romans chapter 10 where I'm supposed to be teaching we are actually dealing with Israel present but it's leading up to Israel future. And this is all part of the backstory. The new covenant is going to take place during the millennial kingdom when Jesus will come back to the earth, establish himself as king of 
Israel, king from Jerusalem and effectively king of the world. And at that time, the new covenant relationship will begin with the Jews, with the house of Israel. Today, in chapter 10, if you will, you'll see this in a moment, if I can get there, that Jews and Gentiles who believe in Christ, or Yeshua, Yamashia, the Messiah, they will be recipients of the blessings of the new covenant, but they have not yet fully understood all of the ramifications of the new covenant, and it has not been fulfilled. It is just beginning to be fulfilled. Keep those things in mind. And this is the circumcision of the heart that is referred to multiple times in the Old Testament. And this is where God will cause the people to love him. Look at it again. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So God's the one that's doing the changing. It's not man. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and those who hate you, who persecute you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of this law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and you will, because I will cause you to, is what he's really saying. I will cause you to love me. I will cause you to love me with all of your heart and all of your soul. Something that we could not even begin to grasp if it were not for the grace of God at work. This is where we covered last week when I said it is not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, but of God who showeth mercy, right? So you could desire him all day long, but unless God was the equipper, you couldn't love him. You couldn't desire him. You couldn't be saved. It is God who has initiated the relationship and God who will complete the relationship with us in the church age and with the Jews by covenant in days to come. Verse 11, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. We get into prophecy here. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven to bring it down to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is is it beyond the sea or the abyss. But you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Now in this case, he's talking about the law. You'll see that Paul will put a new spin on that into, uh, uh, the, the Roman audience in chapter 10. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God and walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. In the land, in the land. We're not talking about a spiritual fulfillment here. We're talking about literal fulfillment in the land. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. Now he's talking to them those that are on this, this side of the Jordan, uh, the uh, east side of Jordan, uh, heading westward over the Jordan Valley and into Israel. You shall not prolong your days in the land if you disobey. And you cross over the Jordan and go into to possess that I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live and that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. Now he swore that they would dwell in the land that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob their dis- and their descendants. So it's not to the Ishmaelites. The Muslims today that are contending that it belongs to them, they're wrong the descendants of Ishmael. No, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, The Palestinians that say that God has replaced Israel and that they are the ones with the right to the land. They're wrong. God has a future plan for Israel. Now go back to Romans chapter 10. Let's see if we can teach the book I'm actually supposed to be teaching. 
we'll get a few minutes in. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. So God has put a desire in his heart and he even prays about it. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now he's dealing with Israelology, but with the soteriology in mind. How are they going to be saved? They must trust the Lord, not themselves. They can't trust in themselves. They have to trust the Lord. They want to establish their own righteousness instead of enjoying the righteousness of God. It's not a righteousness they can attain. Only God can impute it to them. It's his righteousness given, not theirs earned. That's the problem. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And again, we could talk about this all day long. We've spent Sunday after Sunday on this. In fact, one topical I did on antinomianism, uh, meaning the, well, depending on your definitions, which we enjoyed, against law or in the replacement of the law. Anti means in the place of, okay? And so in this context, we have a new law that is written into the hearts of men in the new covenant and the old covenant law that has come to an end in Christ. And this is what is being communicated in part where we see, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the law has been annulled. It is no longer. It also means that Christ is the end result that was being pointed to through the law. Now, Paul says this to the Galatians when he says that the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. So once you have come to Christ, you're no longer under a tutor. This is all in Galatians chapter three. You can look at it yourself. And so he is the end result of the law. The law could not make you righteous because no one could keep the law. Therefore, the law became a schoolmaster or a tutor to point you to Christ, to say, you can't do it. You cannot attain it on your own. You have to have the righteousness of God imputed to you. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, and then he quotes from Leviticus, the man who does those things shall live by them. Now, what in the world is going on? He's saying that if you do all the law, you will be made alive by them. But here's the problem. No one can do it. Because the law did not require that you do it for a minute or for an hour or for a month. It required that you did it all the time perfectly and never fail. For if you are guilty in one part of the law, you are guilty of all of the law, the Bible says. And therefore, Paul has already made the case that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one that can do righteous, no, not one. And therefore, we must not make any effort of our own to attain a righteousness of our own. We must be imputed with the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God. That's the first aspect of this discussion in verse 3. They were seeking to obtain their own righteousness rather than having the imputation of the righteousness of God upon them, the clothing of righteousness upon them, which is by faith alone. Moses writes about this righteousness of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. And the real contingency is in mind. If a man could live by, or could do them, he could live by them but a man cannot. We're all guilty before God. I don't have time to illustrate. I could make you miserable, but I won't. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Quoting from Deuteronomy 30, we just read, the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. And then Paul adds this comment. He's quoting, notice in your Bible, if you will, uh, in, 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 if indeed your Bible has this in quote marks and italicized versus those that are non-italicized and non-quoted, he adds in a bracket, the righteousness of faith speaks in this way, quote, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, in quote, bracket, 
That is to bring Christ down from above. So his other word, in other words, Paul is now elaborating on what was said in Deuteronomy 30 related to the law. And he's putting Christ in the picture. Because Christ is the end of the law to those that believe. Or, verse 7, quote, who will descend into the abyss, end quote. The sea, remember that we talked about the sea. And then he adds in brackets, that is, to bring Christ up from the death. Now, you guys probably know enough about the Greek that you realize that there is no brackets and uh, quote marks and uh, commas and periods and so forth in Greek. And so that's added by the translators, but in this case, appropriately. Because they're identifying for you what was quoted from Deuteronomy and then what is elaborated on or uh, extrapolated by in Paul, with Paul. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. You can't go down into the abyss. He, what is he saying? Look, you, you can't do it. You couldn't go up to heaven and get him and you couldn't go down into the grave and bring him up. He's already resurrected. He's already come to the earth. He was born of a virgin. We know this. What does it say? Verse 8, quote, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, end quote. Now we already read that and he was referring to the law. Now in brackets, Paul adds, that is the word of faith which we preach. So now he's saying, look, we're not talking about the old law because Christ is the end of the law. Now we're talking about the word of faith, the gospel, the hope that we have in Christ. That if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so what is he really saying? He's saying that this is something of the heart. Your mouth might say, I believe, but if you do not believe in your heart, you're not saved. In fact, the interesting thing here is that in the Greek, the word and in verse 10 and the word and in verse 9 are different words in the Greek. One in verse 9, I'll read it this way for you, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart and believe in your heart. So he's talking about the quotation from uh, Deuteronomy 30. And he says, it's, the word is near you, it's in your mouth. And so go ahead, confess it. That's fine, you should. But you also must, and you must also, right? You must also believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. For with the, mouth, with the heart, now reversing the order, one believes unto righteousness. And then the word and here is actually but in the Greek. It's, it's a conjunction that's an adversarial conjunction so in other words it's in contrast to the former but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation so you can confess that you're saved but if you don't believe you're not okay now the reason i only point i point that out is because i hate formulas you guys know that you know if you get 10 people together to pray god will listen more than if you have nine you know, because we're two or more gathered together, right? So we get two people together, then God has to listen. That's not even what it's talk. That's not even what that's about. That's all about. The, well, I don't have time for that. Just, just because it's going to mess with you. You had to have ten men in a city to have a synagogue, and you had to have a synagogue to pray. So, in, in other words, it was kind of a. You could still pray, but it wasn't as official, right? And you couldn't have a synagogue. Remember Philippi and Lydia and all that? We talked about that the other day. But because uh, they met by the river, because they didn't have 10 men. So we're two or more, Jesus said, are, are gathered together. But that's another issue. I hate formulas. See, because now in the formula that a lot of people get out of this is that you have to uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved and you have to confess him with your mouth in order to be saved. And that's not what this is being, that's not what's being communicated here. Okay, I want you to know that. So should you communicate it? Yes. Is that where he's going to go with it? Yes. But you see where Paul takes these passages eisegetically out of their context and he's putting new meaning to them in the New Testament. He's, a, he's developing a thought by pulling these pieces and putting them together into a sermon. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like it. That's messing you. You got to think about that. 
Now, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit inspired. You don't like it. Paul the Apostle. What are you doing? Criticizing Paul? Well, no. The reason I'm uncomfortable with it is for the same reason that the Jews would be. Because they would look at that and say, look, that's not what the context was all about. But as pointed out again, and I referenced Pastor Chuck, this morning we were talking about it. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to communicate these things and to take these things illustratively and contextually and give an application to them that the believer and, in this case, the Jew and the Gentile would both be able to understand. Don't you remember what God promised? He promised that you're going to inherit the land. He promised that you're going to serve the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul. God's going to change your life. And he's going to do it by circumcising your heart. And it's not going to be because you went up to heaven and got Christ and brought him down. And it's not because you went down into the abyss and got him and brought him back from the dead. It was in your mouth. It was right there before you. It was the word of faith that we preach. That if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And so, you, yes, confess with your mouth. And he goes on to talk about the ministry of preaching the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those that bring the gospel of peace and so forth, which we'll deal with a bit more next week. 